Hello and welcome to Red Risks Media. This is a live event, things can go wrong. Please stick with us while we try and sort some of those gremlins out. We live stream to LinkedIn, to YouTube and to Twitter, sometimes to Facebook. So please do join us on these live events. Now, if you've not been here before, we'd welcome you to subscribe to our newsletter. No spam, I promise. It's only about the live events that are coming up. Now, enough of that. Let's just get on with the show. Terry Mathis, how are you? How are you, Sonny? Great to I'm see you. I'm very good. Good to see you, too. I haven't spoken to you for a long time, have I? Things well. okay? Last year. God, yeah. When we did, um, what was it, Safety Leadership and Stumbling Blocks. That was that was a humdinger. It was a really good show, and uh, we should follow up on that, shouldn't we? Absolutely. Now, talking about humdinger shows, we've got a great one today, haven't we? We've got a fantastic oh, yeah. guest. Um, yes, I, one, of I, favorite, one of my favorite people. Uh, you know, the, the National Safety Council in the U.S. has a little uh, uh, spot that they call CEOs Who Get It. I don't always agree with who they give it to, but I certainly love the title because there are organizational leaders who really get it and there's some who just don't. Yeah. You know, they give lip service to safety, but they don't really understand what it takes to make it happen. Your guest today is somebody who does, definitely does, and has made it happen for years now. Well, let's find out a little bit of a, I've got a little video to explain our guest's background. So let's just... Uh, catch that out. Kelvin is the Vice President of Environment Health, Safety and Quality at CF Industries, a leading global manufacturer of hydrogen and nitrogen products committed to the clean energy economy. Kelvin is an accomplished environment health and safety professional with more than 25 years of experience building global results-driven EHS programs and dynamic EHS teams. An excellent communicator and critical thinker, Kelvin sets corporate EHS visions, establishes EHS strategies, and manages teams and programs with decisiveness, compassion, and resourcefulness. Kelvin is an effective, charismatic, and highly respected leader with extensive cross-cultural international experience and a can-do attitude and strong work ethic. Kelvin's specialities include international EHS operations management, culture change, sustainability, corporate responsibility, to name just a few. Without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Calvin Roth. <laughs> Calvin. <laughs> I'm going I'm to have to get a copy of that to show my wife. Yeah, I must, yeah. yeah. We, 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 we sell them. <laughs> Great to see you, Calvin. Great to see you, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm... Uh, when I thought about this show, having spoken to Terry and putting it together, I, th I thought to myself, how can I describe this show? You know, when you buy those mystery novels, uh, I don't know if you do, you do, but you always start reading at the front end and you want to jump straight to the back to see who, who did it. Okay. It's a bit like that, this show, where I want to know what is it that you do to get these safety statistics that are outstanding? What do you think, Terry? I mean, we talked about it earlier, didn't we? Well, he does a lot of things to do that. that that's kind of the, uh, I, I don't know, the secret of Kelvin to me. On my birthday, he wrote a, an analysis of me like I was a bottle of wine and, and kind of described the, the characteristics. You know, it, there's not one thing that Kelvin does. Uh, he does, I don't think he thinks there's magic beans or a silver bullet or anything like that. He knows you have to do everything well and you have to look at this thing holistically. And from his experience, he's got a very realistic view of what it takes to make it happen. And he just goes in with that view and makes it happen. Mm -hmm. And he certainly has done that the last few years at CF. The, their results are some of the most striking that I've seen anywhere, certainly among my clients. Uh, they're leading the pack out there right now. They are really 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 doing an, an excellent job but kelvin can tell you better than i can yeah well, let, let's with... open that up kelvin tell us a little bit about 2020 then in lockdown mode and everything else how you did yeah so um you know i think 2020 uh, i mean clearly there were challenges clearly there were hardships but i think like any uh steel in fire um there were a lot of really valuable lessons learned they were painful but, but they were also valuable. And I think, you know, using, uh, using some of the terminology that was floating around, I think, you know, essential, right? What is essential to the business? And boy, did we get slapped upside the face with that um, last year, right? Like 
There was no, there was no room, there was no wiggle room for non-essential activities, for non-essential components. Um, I think the other fun part was last year, you know, HSE safety, we weren't part of the business strategy. We were the business strategy. Yeah. You know, if, if a business was going to survive, they had to figure out first how to protect their people, how to protect their, their teams, their business. Um, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a side note by any means. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we ended the year, um, with really good performance and I think not surprising to probably anyone on this call, but our performance, not only did we set our best ever safety performance, we also set our best ever production performance and our best ever shipping performance. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's living proof that uh, production and uh, operations go hand in hand with safety. But you're you're on the, it's not a one shot wonder for you, is it? I mean, it's quite sustained. It's year on year, isn't it? So far, yeah, so far it has been, and I think that's you know that's always the challenge, right? Like uh, it, your your best every year is always followed up with what's next, right? Yeah. And um, I think for many of us, we don't even get that. You know, in the U.S., for those of you not in the U.S., anytime. Uh, Anytime someone wins the Super Bowl, they always say, what are you doing next? And it's like, I'm going to Disney World, right? Um, I'm a killer? What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kelvin Killer. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, um, you know, I, I think for many safety people, we don't even get that Disney World moment, right? Like it's, we're immediately into the next and immediately looking at what's next. And I think... Uh, you know, as we've talked about um, ahead of this call and, you know, in other times, uh, a big part of that is strategy. And you have to, you have to have a strategy. That strategy has to be um, appropriate. It has to be flexible and it has to match your people. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I saw the, uh, I saw the chats coming in just to catch up. Uh, Vince Butler says, uh, Everyone, hello. There's a lot of hellos coming in, so we've got quite a few folks on the show. Uh, listen, everybody on live chat, you know we want to get your questions to Kelvin. I don't know what the killer thing was about, by the way. Maybe some text. <laughs> I so even line, Kelvin. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, but do this is a great opportunity to learn from what Kelvin's been doing, the lessons that have been learned. So let's capitalize on that a bit more. So you have operation and terry please chime in and uh, if i've missed anything just take us in that direction your operations are in the high risk category aren't they it's not as if you're making uh, balloons or anything you're actually making right. yeah I mean, that's, I mean, that's scary stuff yeah we you know we as i like to summarize we take a highly flammable material methane we convert that into a highly toxic material, ammonia. We then sometimes upgrade that into ammonium nitrate. And uh, yeah, there's risk all along. It's high temperature, high pressure, um, some chemicals that can, if not handled properly, can certainly uh, humble you. So uh, I, I think that's, you know, that's that's been a challenge, but I think it's also one where um, there are opportunities in that. You know, if you think of a race car driver, they're probably more likely to crash on the motorway than they are on the track. And that's because they're they're very in tune with the hazards that exist on the track. And I, I think that's, you know, that's something we've seen with, with our people. And quite frankly, it, I think that's how we responded to a lot of the COVID challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, once we could get our arms around what is the hazard, um, our people are pretty effective in saying, okay, let's understand the hazard. Let's understand the precautions that protect us from that hazard and let's go do them. And can, I think we saw a lot of that. Sorry, can I ask a question that's burning in my head? And I know Terry's got lots of questions as well. Your operations, your organization, you are worldwide aren't you? You're all over the place. How do you maintain that level of performance, taking into account culture, 
taking into account all sorts of other dynamics that go on, how do you manage to keep that balance of performance across each organization? Well, I, I think it's um, I, I think it's a combination of things. One, you have to have a you have to have a clearly stated vision and goal, right? You have to let people know what what are the expectations. Um, but then you have to you have to be flexible in how that goal is achieved, you know. And I think the if we try to prescribe how we uh, how we do things at every one of our locations, I don't think we would have the same performance. Mm -hmm. And it's also one where I don't think you'd have the same engagement. Uh, okay. So I, to me, that's kind of the you've got to set the framework, but then you have to. Uh, you have to allow for the local variation. And I, yeah. I often use the example of a jazz standard, right? We all know jazz standards once they start getting played, but every performer plays it a little bit differently. And it doesn't make it better or worse. It's just the same standard being expressed differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terry, yeah. any thoughts? Yeah, well, Kellum and I have been talking about this for a long time. You and I talked about it last year. Yeah. But uh, the definition of safety excellence isn't just having those lagging indicators like Kelvin has this year. You know, the, the real definition of safety excellence is, is producing those great lagging indicators, but it's also understanding exactly how you produce those indicators. And Kelvin has all kinds of neat, nifty KPIs and things within his organization that help to accomplish those things. And then the last part, the last two parts of that definition are being able to repeat it again next year. Well, Kelvin hadn't just done as good next year, he's done better next year for the last several years with this, which, which tells you he has a strategy and his strategy includes, you know, how to repeat it again next year. But then the last part is being open to the fact that no matter how well you did, there's always something better. And you've always got to keep your mind open and be looking for that next best thing that's out there. And I've, I've watched Kelvin over the years discover a number of those things. And, uh, uh, you know, to say, well, yes, this was really good, but guess what? We just found an even better way to do it. Mm. But Carlos, <laughs> Carlos says, could not agree more with what you just said, Kelvin. I like uh, Carlos. <laughs> yeah, he's good, isn't he? Uh, Matt says, well done. Jeanette from Poland. Hello, everyone. Uh, I mean, we've got folks on here. Jorge is in Mexico. Uh, Jeanette's in Poland. Folks in Saudi Arabia, the UK. So we've got a fair fair selection of, of, of uh, countries here. Um, on the subject of leading and lagging indicators, you know that old chestnut people have arguments over, which is, well, I focus just on leading. I focus just on lagging and I do this and I do that. In your experience then, do you gravitate towards one particular metric or one particular sort of indicator like leading or lagging? What's, what's your sort of game? No, because I think the, the, what's lost in the discussion about leading versus lagging is where are you going? And there are some, you know, it, it's a little like uh, if you think of your nav system, right? You're in your car. If they tell you to turn at the McDonald's, that's a very key. That's a very key thing. You'll want to know to turn at the McDonald's. But once you've passed that McDonald's, there's no point in talking about it anymore. You don't want your nav system to go back and say, hey, remember when you turned at the McDonald's? Yeah, well, stay on that road. No, you're, you're done. And I think um, there is this. I, I think uh, misunderstanding or misexpectation that leading and lagging indicators are permanent. You know, we once we label them as KPIs, you can't move off of that. But I think it's really talking about what, where are you going and what measures are you using to determine whether you're getting closer or further away. And sometimes those are sometimes those are leading. Sometimes those are lagging because you can only see them uh, with the benefit of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I, I think so, you need all of them. Yeah, so you don't bias towards one. You're saying that it has to have a focus and a mission and you've got to keep your eye on the ball, not forget about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Jorge, Jorge chimed in and says, how much the strategies in HSE changed after the pandemic experience? Did you find you have to do a complete review and change yeah, that many? So, 
So surprisingly for us, not at all. The, the strategy itself held true. The strategy itself, we stuck to. How we delivered the strategy, that's where we saw changes, right? So um, we, we still, one of our key things is engagement and you know how do we measure engagement and it's through employee feedback whether that's near misses hazard ids you know observations leadership activities um and it wasn't to say you know in the past we might have done toolbox talks around specific things but uh, you know some of our sites developed what they called covid coaches and it you know it was largely the same same kind of process, but it it was just how they delivered it and how they worked with people that um, that changed. I think our overall our overall strategy we still stuck to that, um, but how we delivered it changed. And I think you know I, I guess there there's also different layers, if you will. There's certainly the overall strategy of um, you know let's keep people engaged and let's keep people. Uh, you know, um, empowered and make sure they're making the right decisions. But there's a lot of nuances and variances that might come up from year to year. Mm. Terry, you and I talked about leading and lagging as well, didn't we? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a balanced scorecard kind of person. Mm. I need to measure the whole cycle <clears throat> around there. But one of the things that, that you have to realize, we've been, we've been managing safety with lagging indicators for years and years. Mm. When you get down to where worldwide, you only had four data points to learn from last year, like Kelvin does like that. You can't manage that way anymore. That's not enough data to help get you to the next level in safety. So you have to start looking at other factors. You can't just analyze your accidents and react to them the way we have in the past. There aren't enough of them. You don't have enough data there anymore. And so it's kind of like, uh, Kelvin makes some nice analogies. It's like flying an airplane, you know, on a clear, bright day, you just look out the windshield and go where you want to go. Mm -hmm. When you're locked in, you've got to fly with instruments Absolutely. and getting to that flying with instruments point in yeah. his company right now. He, he can't just look at the accidents and react to those and get a little bit better next year. Yeah. You know, he's got to have other, other more sophisticated metrics, yeah. but he's wise too. And knowing that those metrics change. You know, yeah. that, well, you know, getting from point A to B isn't the same as getting from point B to C. And sometimes the, the measurements that you're looking at have to be different. Mm -hmm. Steve, Steve's uh, asking questions. Did the COVID change the way you delivered technology? Did you use it more or less? I guess this is a classic example, isn't it? Did you use, did you do, did you get zoomified to death? <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> Not I, actually. <laughs> great, great question. So absolutely. But I think you know, one of the things we really learned is that you have to empower people, right? And not being, not being able to visit people, not being able to have those in-person conversations means you have to figure out another way to keep them engaged, to keep them connected, um, and to, to quite frankly, keep their attention, right? We, we all, you know, COVID, COVID removed any sort of work-life separation that existed in reality or pretend, right? Like it all got smashed together and in most Zoom calls you see, you see it all, right? Um, but I think we, we also looked at how do, we make, how do we make some of those stories more transparent? How do we share, you know, we shared a lot of videos, you know, between the between the different sites, from the company out to the sites, we also started working on um, developing dashboards that really give the sites some of that instantaneous feedback on how things are progressing, so that they can make their own decisions. And I think that's a that's a key part. You want people to get your message. You want people to understand the strategy, but you also want to give them the tools so they can make those good decisions without you having to be there all the time. I, you know, I've been doing these for a while now and um, this, I've noticed a sort of a trend, okay? So sometimes people have tribalisms focused on behavior-based safety, cultural, people-based, people-centric, et cetera. And you know, I have that design, that safety continuum of going from design, engineering procedures and people. Where did you find that you needed to tweak in terms of getting the juice that you're getting out of the 
system now? Because your performance is, the company's performance is outstanding, okay? Did you go in and tweak the design or was it not fix the worker, but do something in terms of getting the workforce up to where you wanted them to? What did you do or was so, it? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna first not answer your question specifically. <laughs> <laughs> um, you sound like a politician. <laughs> no, you know, and, and uh, I'm glad to see you've got uh, callers from all over because, you know, let's talk about Liverpool, the, sure. the football club. Okay. Liverpool was untouchable last season, mm -hmm. literally untouchable. They executed everything perfectly. Everything worked exactly as Jurgen Klopp had sketched it out. Okay. To a, to a T, right? Um, this year, they're hopeless. And you can look at certain things and you can say, well, their strategy is wrong. The strat but the strategy worked last year, right? You can't, you can't say inherently the strategy is wrong. It You have to be able to step back from what's going on and say, what is working? What's not working? What do I need to improve? And when I hear discussions around, do I need BBS or do I need HOP or do I need better procedures or do I need more training? Um, for me, it's what what is the problem we're trying to solve, right? If I look at if I look at Liverpool, their their front line is the same as it was last year, but they've lost their back line. They've lost their defense. They can't play that high pressing game that they played all last year. So there, for you to focus on <laughs> offense and say, well, offense is what got us to the win last year. Therefore, I'm going to continue to focus on offense this year um, would be a fool's uh, would be a fool's errand, right? You need to say, what's not working? Where do we have our challenges? And let's focus on that. But th that, that almost, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's almost suggesting to me that maybe we're shining a light into a room that's already well lit, whereas we're not really looking at things like you say, the back line. We should be looking on things that aren't, that we've taken our eye, or eye off. Did, did, I, did I understand that in that context? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not, um, I, I think there are also the, what are the, you know, even last, I'll stay on my example, right? Even last year, every, every, uh, post-game press conference, Jurgen Klopp would say, well, there's things we can improve and blah, blah, blah. And I don't think he was saying that because he just wanted to entertain the reporters. I think there really are things that he wanted to improve and that they work to improve. So um, kind of to your point, yeah, I mean, maybe there's already a bright light on that, but <clears throat> I understand that. And if, uh, you know, you also need to understand what are the specific skills when when you're early on in your safety journey or early on in your football journey, um, just about anything you focus on will result in improvement, mm. right? You'll get more wins. Yeah. But as you, get, as you get better, as you start to get to the pointy end of, uh, of that stick, you, you need to really be very specific about what we're doing, right? And we need to say, what are the things that are working well and what are the things that are not and what's my basis for saying that so kind of going back to uh the previous question you need that technology and that understanding to that data analysis to to say what what's working what's not and how do we get better mm -hmm. well i'm gonna i'm gonna just listen to some of the questions coming up but terry your thoughts on that then yeah, well marshall goldsmith wrote a book several years ago that was uh monumental and it's called what got you here won't get you there mm -hmm. i think that's exactly what kelvin's talking about as you go from bad to good there's a set of a set of tools you use there are a set of things that you can do they're obvious you know at, at the basic level like that like that almost anything you do is going to make you better like that the further you get along in that progression the finer the tools have to be mm -hmm. because the, the problem is less defined less obvious and it requires fine tuning that you don't do with the big knob. You know, you got to stick a little screwdriver in there and, and, and turn that little small thing in there to, to get that little fine tuning at the end. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've kind of specialized in my career over the years is that safety excellence. You know, I, I think almost anybody can, if, if you suck at safety, almost anybody that knows anything can help you get better. Mm -hmm. You know, but once you get up to that level, 
uh, not everybody has tools that, that work at that level. And uh, that's that's what I've tried to specialize in. And that's that's what Kelvin has, has been facing, you know, in the, the last little while. You know, not not just everything. You can't just be basic. You can't just be a good player. You can't just get out on the field and run around and kick the ball. You know, you, you've got to get that strategy down to some really fine points that help you get a, a little bit of an edge over that other team, just a little bit better. They're all pros. They, they're all talented, you know, and Kelvin's people are that way, too. He doesn't he doesn't have a, a horrible safety performer anywhere in his organization. And it's hard to make a good safety performer. Great. That's a lot harder than making a sucky performer decent. You know, and that's that's the set of tools and the set of metrics that you have to get to at, the, at this level. I think that's a great nugget for people to take away. And that is you you if you're not getting what you want, it might be a good opportunity to see what you're actually looking at now, because it, it's like training for a marathon or something. The first time you start it, you know, it's easy to knock off the minutes and then you get down to the last few seconds. You have to focus very, very hard in getting those uh, one second off your personal best or something. Um, Jorge's come in with some thoughts here. He says, mental health and concentration on the job were some aspects uh, that would need to be increased during the pandemic period. In your experience, they were strongly included in the strategies. Uh, well, I can understand that question because we were all under a lot of stress, weren't we, Kelvin? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, uh, it, first of all, it's an excellent point. And I think it's one where if we learned nothing else last year from a safety perspective, is that safety doesn't start or end at the fence line. It doesn't start or end at the office door. Um, it really, you know, we, we lost the luxury of only focusing on the worker part of the humans we are working with, right? Um, last year, slap that in our face um, and really reinforce that. And yeah, great point. If, if people aren't in the mental state to come to work, then you're probably better off not having them come to work, you know? Yeah, you know, and I, and I think even a lot of the diversity and inclusion discussions, which have rightfully been been happening and taken a very front seat, you know, we look at it as, is your workplace safe for everyone? And that's mental safety, that's psychological safety, that's, you, you want a welcoming, safe workplace. And when you, yeah, so to the strategy part, Absolutely, because we know people give feedback in different ways. Yeah. Um, you know, Terry can tell you we've never had a target for hazard IDs or near misses. And part of the reason is often safety professionals get into this completely non-productive conversation of, well, that wasn't really a, a near miss. That was more of a hazard ID. Or I know you marked that as a hazard ID, but really that was a first <laughs> thing. No, that was feedback. And I think that's the part you're missing. And the part, you know, often we miss is to say that was feedback. That was someone saying, hey, things are not OK. And then let's have a conversation and figure out why they're not OK. Let's address that. And I think that's that's kind of how we we look at the mental health and and um, kind of the psychological safety at, at our sites. I love the fact that you've really probably echoed what a lot of people are thinking out there, and that is we spend far too long <laughs> discussing the minutiae of, well, it's paralysis by analysis, isn't it? We should really be just getting down to saying that is feedback and we need feedback rather than working a vacuum. Um, Terry, Matt uh, says, have to constantly evolve. COVID helped bring global awareness of safety from PP to practice the mental health. Well said, Terry. And we have someone from Algeria chiming in as well. Aisha Wells, nice to see you. Well, you know, you've you've imparted quite a bit of knowledge there. From what I can understand, it's basically saying focus on, well, uh, here and now and focus on things that are important, focus on things that are going to get you where you want to go, not things that you've always been doing because obviously you get what you've always got. Are there any are there any sort of things that you would say of the last year you've done where you felt you know we could we all say is we could have done a bit better right are there any areas where for example if you're not feeling like you, you didn't do better there are others out there who probably have not even got on the start compared to you what sort of things would you say are sort of 
things to look out for on the blind side? Sure. So um, I think one of the areas we've identified is, um, and this I think is a common safety person view. You know, we feel comforted by paper, right? <laughs> if we've got a, a, a procedure, if we've got a checklist, if we've got a permit, we feel comforted. Um, but the the real question is, are is that paper delivering value? You know, and I think it's real easy for us to add things to do. I think it's real easy to say, okay, here's a new program. Let's go out and, you know, now create a new permit or put another box on our, our safe work permit. Um, the challenge is making that efficient and making it effective because the the users of this, they don't want another thing to do, right? They want to do the same thing better, you know? And I think that's, you know, often we're asking them to do another thing rather than just saying, here's a way for you to do the same thing better. And so that that's really when we look at our practices this year, that's really where we're we're focusing. So what, you know, what paperwork did we create that wasn't needed? What, uh, what steps did we create that weren't needed? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and often you get a real good hint at this when you find yourself saying, oh, that all that stuff's just pencil whipped, right? Mm -hmm. They just, they just filled that in. They don't, well, why are they doing that? Right? Like, let's have those conversations. What, you know, procedures, <clears throat> You know, how many procedures are written by people that don't do the task? Mm. Um, and if you went and sat down with the people that did the task, would they actually give you a book worth of material to write down? Probably not. <laughs> you know, they would probably just say, well, here are the four things I do and blah, blah, blah. And you, that's what we ought to write down. Mm. Right? So I think mm. that, that's, our, that's our big challenge. Mm -hmm. this year. Terry, is that, is that mood or inaction? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm glad Kelvin used this word again because we got further away from it than I wanted to comment on it. I think one of the keys to Kelvin's success lies in that word conversation. Mm -hmm. Kelvin is not an information dump guy. He doesn't go out and tell people what to do. He goes out and listens to people, the people in the, in the workplace. And he doesn't start a, an information flow. He starts a conversation, a two way thing that goes back and forth. And because of that, he gets a daily dose of reality that a lot of safety professionals just don't get. You know, you can you can uh, improve safety by telling people things out in the workplace, but you can you your telling gets fabulously better if you do some listening mm -hmm. along the way. And the one other thing that that came to mind too, uh, we we talked about metrics, and now we're talking about programs, paperwork, especially like that. You know, it's it's easier to add something than it is to get rid of something. Mm -hmm. Once it's, once it's established, God, it's like it takes an act of Congress to, 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 to make it go away. But metrics are the same way. And, you know, we human beings tend to measure what's measurable rather than what's important. You know, so we look at something and say, well, wait, we don't have an exact discrete measurement way to measure that thing like that. So let's don't measure it. You know, an inexact measure of an important thing is much more useful than an absolute exact measurement of something that's not that important. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, like the paperwork Kelvin's talking about, the metrics are the same way. You know, sometimes we measure things just because they're easy to measure, you know, and we don't use them for anything. And it's hard to get rid of those metrics. It's hard to get rid of that paperwork. It's hard to get rid of those practices that maybe once had a purpose, but don't anymore. But yeah. that's something that Kelvin's organization actually does. They can actually get rid of something as well as add something. But that, that means you're agile. That means you're nimble, doesn't it? So do you do you do do you do things like scrum or agile thinking or agile working or any of those things? How how do, how do you declutter? <laughs> uh, so no, I'm I'm laughing because you basically said, do you have a formal structured program to be nimble? Um, yeah, no, <laughs> is the answer. <laughs> you just you just use the gray cells basically, yeah. No, I, I think part, I mean, for us, quite frankly, it comes from our culture, right? We have, you know, in our company values, they're, they're not values. They actually are how we expect to do business, right? And, and uh, you know, the, the one value you'll see everywhere you go from a safety perspective is do it right. And that's what we've told people. We said, look, 
we know you, it isn't possible for you to memorize every single regulation that's out there. So what we want you to ask yourself is, am I doing this right? Right. And if you do it right, there may be some regulators that disagree with that, but that's my job to, to work with them and convince them they're wrong. Right. But it, it really, if we're doing it right, that's a key part. The other part is our other value is we execute as a team. And I think that really is the being open to ideas, being open to other people's thoughts. There are very few policies, and this isn't even related just to EHS, but any company policy that gets rolled out that you haven't heard of before it gets rolled out. We tend to socialize and over-socialize. And I can tell you when I first joined CF, you know, six plus years ago, I found it a little bit frustrating, you know, like, why can't I just snap my fingers and this policy should happen, right? Um, <laughs> But in reality, what, what we do is we spend a good 12 months socializing things sometimes. And um, when, you know, when we get that feedback, then we implement it and we move forward. And, it, and it's, we don't have to chase it then. At other companies, we've snapped our fingers, rolled it out, but then we've chased it. And then we've had to explain why we're doing it. And then we've had to come back and revise it. And the, uh, you know, I realize saying 12 months of conversation doesn't sound nimble, but I think in it there, that there are conversations and understanding around why we're doing things. And, you know, Simon Sinek is, is uh, an author that, that I really, I really admire. And, and, you know, when he talks about starting with why, if our employees, if our people don't understand why they're doing something, expect that to drop off almost immediately. Right. And but if they understand why they're doing it, then they're going to carry that with them outside of the fence line into other cultures, into other areas. I mean, how many of how many of us have had someone come in from another company and be shocked like you don't do blah, 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 you know, and instead of us saying, well, that's your old company, forget it. We ought to sit down and have that conversation to say. Why is this so important to you? Why did that resonate with you? Let's understand that so that, you know, there, there's probably some good learnings in there. How do we share that? How do we talk about it? Yeah. Just taking a couple of uh, feedbacks here. So Mohammed says attaining top management commitment and routine management review should draw sound safety excellence roadmap. Well, that's the thing you're talking about, about engagement, isn't it? Uh, Tim saying, have you ever considered formatting procedures using ergonomic principles? to complement user engagement. Yep, no, we, we absolutely have. And I think that's uh, that's part of the process that we're looking at now and, and how do we how do we get better around that? But yeah, that's a that's a great point. And I think the you know, the ergonomics has really good feedback. And I, I had an er, ergonomist explain it to me once, you know, ergonomics is what happens below the shoulders. And then uh, human factors is what happens above. and and I think that's, uh, you know, you, you have to address both, right? Mm -hmm. So we are definitely looking at that. And Scott's come in saying, allowing the workers to give their input on procedures. This is about buying, isn't it? And utilizing that input empowers them to perform their tasks safely. How often have we gone in the field? I mean, I'm a process, process guy. How often have we gone in the field and the poor process operator saying, this is a load of rubbish. They should have asked me how to write the thing. Yeah. So it's a yeah. good, good deal. One of the, uh, I read a book at the beginning. Sorry, Terry, I'm hogging the limelight here. You know, I mean, please just jump in. It's because I've got so many questions for Kelvin. You know, I, I, I was just going to comment that what, what Kelvin just described as socializing. Uh, I tend to explain with with another phenomenon. I mean, they're, they're totally inter, interconnected and, and associated. But the fact that people react emotionally before they react rationally. Mm -hmm. And what Kelvin's calling socializing is making people like it. <laughs> you know, by the time they get around to making the change, people like the change. They feel good about the change. You know, that they they're emotionally bought into the change, you know, and then the rationale comes along. And, yeah, that makes sense. You know, and 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 it, it's an easy flow like that. We tend to do that backwards in safety. You know, even in communicating a, an accident report, we tell people what happened, and then we get into the, you know, emotional uh, the story, you know, part of it. It's backwards. You know, we, we we need to do it the other way around. And Kelvin's organization is one 
that's probably one of the best I've ever seen at doing it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time they make a change, people know the change. They know the reason for the change, you know, and they like the change generally when it comes about. So they don't have that emotional backlash. Well, one of the things I'm getting from here is that if you take, if anyone on the call, if you take a procedure that you've got and you go down to the shop floor level and you say to the operator, here's a procedure for that uh, task or whatever you're doing, that operator turns around and says, oh, I haven't seen this before. Let me have a look at it. Okay. You got a few problems there. All right. If that, if that operator turns around and says, I don't need this, I, I will help write the thing. I know what's in there. So maybe that's a sort of an acid test that people should do and do the walk of the procedure and say, look, are we actually following this? Let's talk to the people who are actually applying it. What do you think, Calvin? Is that a dumb idea? No, I, I think that, I think that's a good idea. I think one, the, the one danger in just presenting it or showing up there is, uh, again, you're the people don't want to do something new. They want to do what they're doing better. And when you show up and say, here's the procedure, you are going to get a lot of glad hands, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what we do. Uh-huh. Yep, yep. Um, you know, and so I think you you have to come up with ways that that allow them to do that, that enable that review without them feeling like they have to give you an answer that you expect. Great point. So you avoid the gotcha moment, yeah, basically. Um, I read a great no reason to do it differently. There's an emotional reason to do it better, <laughs> you know, and almost everybody wants that. Well, one of the other things I'm just going to comment, Kelvin's organization, unlike many that I work with right now, doesn't have the more is better mentality. You know, we already talked about getting rid of things like that, but every time they have a deficit that they, that they identify, they don't say, well, we must need to do more. You know, it's, it's, it's often not about more. It's about fixing what's already there. Uh, CF and, and a lot of other people are putting plenty of energy and resources into safety. You know, it's, it's not a matter of doing more. It's a matter of doing better, you know, and, and that's one of the things that, that I think is key to their success is mm -hmm. they have that mentality. And a lot of people haven't gotten out of that. And I would say embrace your inner lazy person. <laughs> exactly. Like, I, I call it, I call it EHS judo because judo is all about using your opponent's momentum to get what you want, right? And exactly. you need to figure out where is the momentum? How can I attach to that momentum to get what I want? You should copyright that. So, uh, Ken. Uh -huh. <laughs> so i i i was gonna say i read a really good book um at the beginning of this year it was by daniel Coyle. it's called the culture code and i looked into that from my experience and i thought he's actually not said anything new here but what he's actually said is it makes you stop and think a little bit more about what's going on from what you're saying, it seems like you practice what Daniel Coyle says in the book, which is about creating belonging and belonging cues. In your organization in CF Industries, would you say that your workforce predominantly feel like they belong or do they feel, how do they feel? Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. I mean, we did our, our first ever um, all employee engagement survey through HR. And, and I think, um, you know, and in the past we've done national safety council, safety culture surveys. And, um, you know, part of the challenge there is that people tend to look at it like uh, a, uh, a test or an exam in school and go, oh, we're at 90%, we're good. That's, you know, or we're at 70%, that's passing, off we go. Well, rather than saying, here's an opportunity to figure out what we're doing well, um, continue to do that, and here's an area to improve. But no, I, I think that's true. I think, um, you know, everyone, and kind of to your question even about agile and nimbleness, if all the ideas have to come from me, then we're not going to be very agile or nimble. But if we've created a space where people can offer up ideas and feel that those ideas will be heard and those ideas ideas will be taken seriously, then that that makes us that much more agile and nimble. And I would say in our COVID response, that that's absolutely what we saw happen. And you know, we 
from a company, we implemented a lot of things very quickly, but it wasn't because I thought of them and it wasn't because, you know, senior leadership came up with the ideas. It was because we were getting a lot of feedback of, hey, if you thought of this, how about this? And we would, we would listen to those and we would chase those down. And, you know, we'd have conversations like, what do you think if we do blah, 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 how, how would we roll that out? Um, you know, so I think that's, yeah, that, that is a key part. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the book, uh, Jim Collins is good to great. Okay. So, um, if you ask any organization, no one ever likes that we're great. You know, they always sort of put it in degrees of good to great. You know, no one says ever we're bad. It's always degrees of it. Where are you on that journey in your in CF industries? I mean, are you, are you say, are you saying, we're good and we're still aspiring to great. Where, where would you put your sort of journey? Um, yeah, I, I think we're good. Um, and we're, we're looking to get better. And I think um, maybe, maybe it all depends on how you define greatness, mm. right? And I, and I know from conversations with Terry, you know, it isn't necessarily about how fast you're going but an organization that's willing to take the ne next step, that's the one I wanna be part of. An organization that says, I'm not satisfied with status quo. I do wanna take a step forward. You know, you can't get to running if you don't take that first step. And I think to me, um, a, a great organization is not necessarily one that, uh, that always achieves the numbers, but is one that is always willing to take that next step. The one that is willing to be um, open and honest with itself to drive itself forward. I mean, you use the example of training for a marathon, right? And in your training, I'm sure that you would not, I don't know if you run marathons, but um, I, you know, I'm assuming you do not compare yourself to the best in the world when you do <laughs> Time, right but but that that should that in no way should make you feel bad right and i think when we talk about safety excellence what we're really talking about is that equivalent of a personal best is that the best that we achieved that we could as a company and if so oh, tremendous right let's celebrate that which by the way i think is another thing we need to do a lot more of you know safety can be a real downer and if you listen to most messaging from safety, it goes a lot like this to the receiver. You screwed up, you screwed up, you screwed up, you almost screwed up. That was a near miss screw up. That was a whoo, that was a screw up waiting to happen or oh my God, what a screw up. Mm -hmm. Well, who wants to hear that, right? And I think we need to celebrate those successes. And certainly if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see that's something I'm very big about celebrating our successes because it is about you want to be the party that people want to come to mm. right mm. and i i think any sort of year like 2020 economic downturns um safety professionals should be jumping on those with both feet because you have an opportunity to share positive messaging in a in a time when there isn't much positive to share absolutely and, and you know Scream, yell, share that. Absolutely, nope. share the good times. Don't just focus on the bad times. Tim's saying, do you find much variance in the safety culture levels across the organization? That's that's a dandy question, isn't it? Mm. So certainly there's differences in cultures. And I, I think there's kind of the framework. I'll use, you know, going back to that jazz standard. Um, and I think there are, I think there are different levels of, they're all at different personal bests. Right. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a site that Terry's working with right now. And, you know, that site, Terry will tell you, does a really nice job. But that site was our poorest performing site last year. Yeah. And that, that really got them fired up. Right. So they're like, hey, we need to step it up. We need to, you know, and, and I think all of our sites have that. Right. All of if you've got more than one site, there is some sort of swagger going on in that site to say, I want to be the best site in the company. And so I think there, yeah, you, you need, there, there are different levels. You do need to challenge those. You do need to understand them. You also need to understand that saying, why can't you be more like site X 
you know, is is a bit like comparing your kids to one another. So, mm. um, you know, it, it you have to understand the differences, but absolutely, you want that internal competition. You want you want to challenge their cultures to get better. Mm. From what I know of you a little bit now, I would say that you would probably hate words like, well, this is a bad actor. You know, it, it, it's an actor and learning the, the, the skills. And obviously, there's some rooms for, room for improvement on there. Terry, you've been involved with uh, Kelvin for a while now. I mean, looking from your perspective, what do you think about their belonging cues and their culture code and all those things? Are, are companies missing out on a big thing here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very few companies do what CF does. This site that we're working with, which is, by the way, in the UK, uh, hasn't belonged to CF forever. It's it's an acquisition of theirs. And uh, it, it had been acquired several times. So this is one of those uh, sites where the workers looked up the flagpole every day to see who owned their company there for a while. And now CF has been there for a while. Guess what? They all feel like CF employees right now. Everybody I interviewed feels like a CF employee. Now, some of them are still feeling out what that is, you know, and exactly what the nuances of it are, but they're there and they're proud. They're proud to be a part of it. You know, one of the questions I ask is, is this a good place to work? And every one of them said, yes, they could tell you things that were wrong and things that would like to be better, but they didn't tell you this is a sucky, bad place to work. Mm. You know, just like your, your poor performer, your bad actor. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. CF's not a bad actor. This isn't a bad place. Mm -hmm. You know, we can see how to make it better and, and we're being listened to on how to do that. And it's, it's progressing in that direction. I, I think that's incredibly important. Back to, back to one of my old sayings, and that is that excellence is a journey, not a destination. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, I think CF recognizes that, that what Kelvin said about taking the next step in the right direction. You know, all even a, what's the old Chinese saying, even a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. An organization that can't step can't get better. They can't yeah. get a lot better. They can't even get a little better. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I've got a question. But before I put my question across, live chatters questions are important. And Vin says, does the organization run or operate competitive leagues for the good stuff? Uh -huh. So, do you yeah. breed competition? Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to owe you for that question because it gives me a chance to talk about one of my favorite things that we do at CF. And right. we have a Stephen R. Wilson Award mm -hmm. for Safety Excellence. And um, I would encourage you to go out to our YouTube channel and watch some of those videos. But each year we solicit innovations. It's a site-by-site -site competition. Uh, we solicit innovations from all of our sites. They then come together um, in the first part of the year to, to share these innovations with their colleagues. Um, it's all, um, all walks of, you know, all cuts of the organization come as part of the selection committee. The selection committee then whittles it down to the final five. And we do uh, videos of those final five that we post out on YouTube and share on LinkedIn and other places. Um, and then uh, the the winners are the, the winners are then selected by our senior leadership team. They come out here to uh, to uh, the corporate office. They present to our senior leadership. The winner is selected, and then the winners actually get flown out to our board of directors meeting and get to present to our board of directors. And, um, you know, and I think all of us know board of directors stay in nice places. Those meetings are held at, you know, very nice. Never. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I think it's one where the the winning site gets that accolade, that accolade and, and they get a trophy that they keep for the year um, and get to celebrate and have parties with and, um, but it, it's a lot of fun and it is about, it is about really celebrating those, you know, having that competition and celebrating it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting because every one of our sites has a different strategy on how they're going to win this. And, uh, you know, they've, they've even, some sites have even implemented many competitions wow. throughout the year of their own employees to get to the best idea so that, when we put out the call for submissions, uh, they're they're able to submit their best ideas. So, 
Well, Terry will already be on the flight there right now, but I'm looking for my invite so I can come and do a live event with you, Kelvin, on the day. You know, I only fly first class, by the way. So. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, Sonny, but he did show me the trophy in the corporate office one time. Did he? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit closer to it than you are. Oh, you, you <laughs> devil. <laughs> So I have a sticky question to ask now, and it'd be remiss of me if I didn't ask you this question, okay? So we talked earlier about the procedures and we said going down to shop floor level and presenting it. So obviously that sort of a situation is a bit, it's a dynamic situation. It can be a difficult situation because people don't want to be feeling in the gotcha moment. You can put it soft, it, couch it, whatever you want. It's still a sticky moment. When we talked earlier about Terry asking the people in the company, are you happy working here? Do you feel like you belong, et cetera, and so on? Do you not feel that could also be a bit biased in some way? How do you how do you unbias it? Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it's, um, it, it's a tough question and I don't know. I think, I think the thing is you don't get stuck on one number, mm -hmm. right? And you keep asking the question, and you don't just get stuck with, uh, you know, I, I've asked it once and, uh, you know, I'm done. I, my, my father, when my father and mother got married, my father told my mother, I love you. I've told you once, please don't make me say it over and over, right? It's going to come as no surprise that they're divorced, right? They, <laughs> it didn't work that way. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I think you have to keep asking the question and I think you have to keep um, prodding because it, to your point, Sonny, the, 